Greetings, everyone. Let's talk about chapter 11. <clears throat> Let's discuss what a fluid is. Um, density, define that thing. Uh, talk about pressure. What happens if you go underwater, you know, if you swim to the bottom of the pool, um, the deeper you are, the higher the pressure. And that has to do with the amount of weight of the water above you pushing down on you. And then uh, Pascal's principle, which is a sort of an application of that. Um, and then gauge pressure, absolute pressure, and pressure measurement, just definitions of those things. And then uh, go into Archimedes' principle, which explains um, the force available that uh, helps you float. Uh, and then talk about uh, some cohesion and adhesion in liquid, surface tension, capillary actions, and then pressures in the body. Okay, so what is a fluid? So you have your phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. Okay, and those are, um, there's also plasma, uh, but we tend to not consider that most of the time because we don't regularly interact with plasmas in the, in, you know, unless you're struck by lightning or something. So, uh, solid, liquid, gas, ice, water, snow, rain, fog, clouds, <coughs> those are all different, uh, um, initiations or instantiations of matter. Uh, okay, so... What is a fluid? A fluid is just something that uh, takes the shape of its container. Um, the atoms are a little more freely able to move around. They're not stuck in a sort of a crystal form. Um, so they're still linked together, but they're not so linked together that they are stuck and they can only jiggle a little bit like they're hooked by springs. Um, and the gas, they're just totally free to move around. They're not sort of attracted to each other at all. Okay, so... Um, uh, you can just read about those things. So a fluid is something that uh, takes the shape of its container. Uh, same with a gas. Um, a gas will fill the container. Um, a fluid will uh, take the shape of the container but not leave it. Um, so that, that's kind of the main difference. Uh, so, you know, if you put ice in a cup over time, it melts, and then it will uh, fully fill that, that uh, cup. Okay, density is defined as the mass per unit volume. So density is this Greek letter rho, um, pronounced rho, and uh, it's just the mass of something divide, divided by the volume of something. So the density is a property of a material, not a property of the shape or anything of the material. So if you have a little ice cube uh, or a big ice cube, they have the same density because it's ice all the way through. Okay, they're going to have different masses, but they're also going to have different volumes. And so the mass and the volume work together to give you the, the density. So density is mass per volume. Um, the unit of that is uh, kilograms. And then volume is meters cubed. Okay, and so that's the unit. Kilogram per meter cubed. Um, the uh, kilogram then um, is is initially defined to be the uh, the mass of a thousand milliliters of water, which has a volume of a thousand uh, centimeters cubed. But anyway, okay. So here's some density. So when you're doing a bunch of these problems, you're going to have to either know or be not know. You're going to have to be given the aluminum either in the problem, or you might have to consult this table um, to look at uh, the uh, uh, to look up what the uh, density is. Okay. So let's say the problem says, oh, there's lead. Okay, it's 11.3 kilograms per meter cubed, 11.3 um, uh, times 10 to the 3. Okay, um, pay attention to the units up there. Um, so this would be 11.3 grams per milliliter, it looks like. Uh, and then glycerin and oxygen and different gases, liquid solids, those are the different densities of those things. Okay, um, <coughs> there's a nice plot here. You could have a ton of feathers. Uh, you could have a ton of feathers here or a ton of bricks. Uh, brick has more density, so it's going to take up less volume um, for the same amount of mass. Okay, so that's that relationship. Whoa, what is this? Uh, go away. I don't know what that is. There we go. Okay, weird. Uh, okay, so there's an experiment here you can do. You get your sugar and your salt, which one weighs more. Try to play around with that. Don't waste food, though. You'll have to eat the salt and sugar after that. Or snort it. I don't know. Okay, uh, let's see. Calculating the mass of a reservoir from its volume. So imagine you're you're at a big uh, dam. This is a dam in China. Or you're at a reservoir. Or you're at the Lock and Dams in Davenport or Rock Island or whatever. And you're uh, 
looking at this, trying to calculate the mass of all the water there in this reservoir. So you know the reservoir has an area of, you know, if you looked at it from the top, let's say you've got the dam here, and then you've got this reservoir of water, and then on the other side, and that's where the river continues to flow, but you're trying to measure the volume uh, or the mass of all the water there. So it says that it's got a depth of 40 meters, okay? So you say, okay, 40 meters deep. It's got a surface area of 50 kilometers squared. So that's, uh, you know, this side times that side gives you the area, and that area is 50 kilometers squared. If you multiply that by 40 meters, um, you can, it's 50, you know, thousand uh, meters squared. You, well, you're gonna have to go, you're gonna have to convert kilometers to meters twice. Um, so 50 and then a thousand times a thousand meters squared times 40 meters deep. What's the mass of that? Okay, so um, this is how they convert it here 10 to 3 meters per kilogram. They convert this one. Um, oh, I'm sorry, no, they do convert that one, the kilometers into meters, and you multiply that and you get a bunch of meters, 2 billion meters cubed. And then from <clears throat> the density table of water, you plug all that in, and you get that it's 2 times 10 to the 12 kilograms. That's a lot of water, okay? Um, that's a billion times a thousand, uh, which is a trillion. Um, so 2 trillion kilograms of uh, uh, water. That's a lot. Um, and then if you did that, the weight of the water, 1.6 or 2 times 10 to the 13 uh, newtons of force, okay? Um, and then the question is, does the dam need to supply that force? The answer is no, okay, because you know the water is pushing down on the ground. Not all that water is pushing against the, um, the wall there. Okay, so that's just an example. Why do you need to pay attention to that? Because it's trying to calculate the mass of something from the volume. So you're gonna have to remember how to calculate the volume of a container if it's a uh, um, uh, rectangle then your rectangle is length times width times height, and that's the volume of um, the thing. Okay, what is going on here? All right, so let's say you've got a rectangle, length times width times height, and that's the volume of that thing. Um, or length times width is the area down here, and then times the height gives you the total volume. If you've got a sphere, it's 4 thirds pi r cubed. If you've got a, uh, that's the volume of a sphere, those are the two general shapes. Oh, maybe a cylinder. Okay, so a cylinder is pi r squared, that's the area down here, times the uh, length or the height of the cylinder. So I'll multiply that. You always want meters cubed whenever you get volume. So this is r squared times h, that's meters squared times meters, so that's meters cubed, length times width times height, and so on, 4 thirds pi r cubed. You want meters cubed for volume. All right, uh, now pressure. Pressure is force per area, okay? Pressure is force per area. So this comes down to, if you've ever laid on a bed of nails, um, it's a fun thing to do um, if you're bored, okay? Um, so let's say you're laying on the bed of nails. If you laid on one nail, it would stab you, right? But if you lay on a bunch of nails, um, the force, your weight, mg, your weight, is spread out over a large area, okay? And um, and in this case, the area is the tip of the nail. So that little area plus this little area plus that little area plus that little area plus that little area equals enough to uh, to not, the, the average force then per nail is not enough to puncture your skin, so then it's safe. Okay, so that's the, that's the thing. If your mass, mg, the force, mg, is spread out over a large area, then you're gonna have a low pressure. If that same weight is spread over a tiny area, tiny little area, then you're gonna get stabbed by the nail, okay? So make sure you don't just lay down on, on any bed of nails. Uh, make sure it's one that someone else has laid on first. Okay, uh, pressure is force per area. Pressure, the unit of that, right? Okay, what is force? Newtons, what is area? Meter squared. So that's a newton per meter squared, that's the unit of uh, pressure, and that is called a pascal. Another thing named after another dude, okay? Um, and so this gets a little bit tricky because um, if you are uh, trying to um, uh, keep track of your units, we've got two names here, 
a Newton and a Pascal. And so this gets a little bit buried. So if you have a Pascal, you gotta remember that's a Newton per meter squared. And then you gotta remember that a Newton is a, a kilogram meters squared per second, okay? Uh, uh, mg, you can remember Newton is ma, so meters per kilogram meter per second squared. Oops, did I say meters squared? Meters per second squared. Uh, and then per meters squared. So a Pascal has a unit of, oops, has a unit of uh, kilogram, okay, what is going on here? Kilo, kilogram per, uh, uh, sorry, this thing is freaking out. Okay, there we go. A Newton, kilogram meter per second squared, and then we got a meter squared here. So then the overall unit is a kilo, here, kilogram per meter second squared. Okay, so if you're trying to work this stuff out, you just have to remember what these names uh, represent. Okay, I'm not sure why that thing was freaking out like that. All right, uh, okay. The, uh, another unit, so you've got Pascal, that's a unit, that's the SI unit, okay? Um, and that's for pressure. The other unit is um, millibar, okay? And the conversion there is just 10,000 Pascal. Um, another one is pounds per square inch, uh, or PSI, and uh, that's what's in your uh, car tires usually is PSI. And then uh, millimeters of mercury is used for if you have a, a manual uh, blood pressure cuff or something like that. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, pressure is defined for all states of matter, but is most important when uh, discussing fluids. Um, that's when we really care about it. Okay, so you can apply the same force, right? With your large finger, if you push on someone's arm, it is not going to uh, puncture uh, the arm. But if the needle is small enough, same force, smaller area, means you're gonna have a larger pressure, boom, you can uh, inject them with the H1N1 vaccine. Okay, so how about the calculating the force by air? What force does a pressure exert? So let's say you're working uh, at the International Space Station, you're an astronaut, um, the pressure gauge on the air tank is 6.9 million pascals. What force uh, does the air inside the tank exert on the flat end of a, cylind a cylindrical tank, 0.15 meters in diameter? Uh, so we have the pressure, 6.9 million pascals. We've got the uh, diameter, uh, 0.15 meters, so we're gonna need to do pi r squared. So we're gonna need to do pi times d over two squared, okay? And then uh, once we do that, um, we we get the force. So then the force here is 1.22 times 10 to the fifth newtons. So we have the pressure times the area, and that gives us the force, okay? Um, and then no wonder the tank must be strong. We have a uh, uh, force exerted on the tank of 100,000 newtons, okay? All right, so one of the things about uh, pressure is that it equally... Uh, is pushing on the walls of the container. So this force is equal to that force, is equal to this force, is equal to that force. All of these forces are equal, and that's why we like to talk about pressure, because it's force per area. So you could calculate the full area of this tire in and out, um, and if you know the pressure, you can calculate the force uh, in there, okay? And the same thing when you're underwater, you got forces pushing on you in all directions, uh, pressure exerted on all sides. Um, so that's interesting. Okay, so what happens when you go underwater? So if you go underwater, um, let's say your pressure, right, uh, is the weight of the water or something divided by the area. You can get the mass of the fluid, times density times volume, and the fluid is uh, area times height, um, area times height of the uh, container, or whether it's a circle or a, you know, whatever container it is, okay? Um, area times the height of the thing, and h is this depth. You can combine the two equations here, and you get that the mass of the water uh, depends on how far under you are, right? So if you're uh, at the surface, okay, then it's this area times that little h. If you go deeper, okay, now you've got more h, so you got more water above you. So then the pressure is uh, mg over a is just the mass of the water, 
times g divided by a and you see that the areas cancel out and you get that the pressure in a fluid is the depth you are times the density of the fluid times gravity. That's kind of wild. It doesn't depend on the area of the water. It doesn't depend on you know the size of the tank or whatever. You could be in a um, you know bathtub one foot underwater or in the ocean one foot underwater and you're going to experience the same amount of pressure. Okay, and the pressure is just h rho g or the height. Um, and there's a picture there showing you that the weight of the water down depends on the area and the height of the water. That's it. Okay, so let's say you want to um, uh, consider the pressure acting on the dam uh, retaining the water. Let's say the dam's 500 meter wa uh, meters wide. The water is 80 meters deep at the dam. What is the average pressure exerted on the dam due to the water? Um, then the average pressure due to the weight of the water is the pressure at the average depth of 40 meters since the pressure increases linear, linearly with depth. So then you can calculate the pressure and it's this much pressure. And then uh, the force exerted on the dam by the water is the average pressure, time, pressure times the area of contact. So we have the pressure uh, of the water pushing on all the surfaces. Um, and then you have the uh, area of the dam is 500 meters uh, wide. Um, and you can use that to calculate the area. Let's do that. So then it's 80 meters, oops, 80 meters times 500 meters. That gives you the area of the dam. So that pressure times that area gives you the average force. And it's this, okay? Um, so that's a thousand times or a little more smaller than the uh, uh, weight of the water itself. Um, so what is it? Less than a percent of the uh, weight. So, uh, or less than 0.1% of the weight. So that's pretty cool. Um, the pressure is independent of the width and length of the lake. It depends only on the depth of the dam. Thus, the force depends only on the water's average depth and the dimensions of the dam, not the horizontal extent of the reservoir. Uh, in the diagram, the thickness of the dam increases with depth to balance the increasing force due to the increasing pressure. Uh, that's a little bit typo there. To balance the increasing force due to the increasing pressure. Okay, um, uh, let's see. Yep, okay, so now there's another thing. So you have the pressure at the bottom of a ocean or a water or fluid. It turns out that walking around on the surface of the earth, we are um, at the bottom of a ocean of oxygen and argon and nitrogen and some other things. Okay, the pressure where we are on the average sea level or the average earth's surface is called one atmosphere, and that's standard atmospheric pressure, or one ATM, and it's about 101,000 uh, pascals, okay? So that means um, where we are, you know, if you stand on the surface here, the amount of the weight of the air above you is 101,000 uh, pascals, which means there'd be 101,000 newtons over a square meter. Um, that's the weight of the air above you, okay? So that's just another... Um, type of uh, density. So if we want to calculate the average density of the atmosphere, um, you can say it uh, extends up 120 kilometers, and you know the pressure is one atmosphere, so you can solve for the density um, just as the pressure one atmosphere divided by 120 kilometers times g, and that gives you the average density here, um, which is, uh, uh, you know, small. Uh, of course, it's higher density near the surface and lower density at the top, it's about 15 times um, because, uh, you know, as you go up in the mountains, the air gets thinner, as they say, and that's because gravity holds a lot of the density. Uh, the, it compresses the air closer to the surface. Okay, how about below water, though? We do the same thing. The pressure below the water um, is uh, you want to go, wait, let's say it says calculate the depth below the surface of water at which the pressure due to the weight of the water equals one atmosphere. <laughs> Okay, so how, how deep do you need to be to have the same uh, amount of weight above you as the entire atmosphere? It looks like you have to go about 10 meters underwater to get the same, to double basically the pressure that you experience uh, on the surface. Okay, um, water is nearly incom incompressible, so that's another um, thing that we care about when we talk about fluids like liquids. Liquids we consider to be incompressible, which means if you try to squish them, they don't get smaller, like a spring um, or a gas. You could squish a gas and compress it and make it smaller into a smaller volume just fine. 
Um, but if you tried to squish water, like when you try to screw a lid on a Tupperware container filled with soup and you put too much soup in there, the soup just licks out and goes everywhere. Okay, so that's that. Uh, 11.5 is Pascal's principle, and Pascal's principle um, says that if you push, uh, apply a force per area onto a fluid, it applies the same pressure everywhere. And since pressure depends on force and area, if you put in a pressure here, it equals the pressure here, as long as the fluid's connected, because it's incompressible, then you can set the two equal to each other. You could say the pressure at this point one has to equal the pressure at this point two by definition of a fluid. It, 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 uh, when you, you can't compress the fluid, so when you push on the fluid, it pushes on everything um, to try to fight back. If you have something, these two pistons, like a hydraulic system, like your car brakes or something like that, then you can use a little force um, over a, uh, a little area and turn that into a big force over a large area. Um, and uh, the difference being that, you know, if you put your foot on the brake, your brake, your foot moves quite a bit, um, but the brake calipers on your car don't move very far. Okay, um, because there's a trade-off here. So the pressure at one is force one over area one, and that equals force two over area two. So if you apply this little force over a little area, then F2, um, F2 is equal to F1 over A1 times A2. If you do that, boom, you get a big area here, and that big area um, gives you the, uh, um, that big area gives you everything you need, uh, extra, extra force. So F2 becomes much bigger um, when you apply a force. Okay, so and you can read through that to get a little bit better idea. Here's a brake system. It's a little bit complicated drawing, isn't it? Um, you apply a force of 100 newtons here, and then you get force out here um, since everything's connected by uh, the fluid here. Um, so 100 newtons there uh, turns into, uh, what, 12,000 newtons um, on, the, on the hydraulic system. So it says you put 100 newtons on the brake pedal, um, which you can, it's a cylinder, uh, force of 500 newtons ex exerted on the master cylinder. So you get 100 newtons here, you get 500 newtons over there. Um, and then the pressure created, uh, the master cylinder has 0.5 centimeters, slave cylinder has a diameter of 2.5 centimeters, calculate the force created at each of the slave cylinders. Okay, so we know F1 is 500 newtons, and we know the uh, diameter is 0.5 centimeters, so we're going to divide that by 2 to get the diameter, or sorry, the radius, and then pi r squared is the area. So we're going to have pi times 0 0.25 centimeters squared, uh, that's our area, and we're going to have 500 newtons, 500 newtons divided by that. So that's going to be the pressure. Um, uh, that's going to be the pressure at the uh, at the master cylinder, and then that has to equal um, the uh, slave cylinder. The pressure at the slave cylinder. So we're going to have an F2 divided by uh, A2, A2. Yep. Okay, and then what you see here is um, F1, uh, pi r, r2 squared over F1, um, pi r, yeah, so he just uh, switched these two things around. Um, let me just make sure that makes sense. We got our 500 newtons divided by our 0.25, yep, so 500 newtons divided by our 0.25 centimeters squared, multiplied by our A2, the area at the caliper, 1.25 centimeters, uh, because they're 2.5 centimeters over there, and you get 10,000 newtons coming out. Okay, so you put, so I guess we're just ignoring that part of the problem. We got 500 newtons coming in there. Um, looks like there's a torque thing going on here. Um, so we got 500 newtons there, and then we get 10,000 newtons coming out. So you need to really squish on those brake pads to get your car to slow down or stop. All right, um, so that's Pascal's simple or principle, and you're always going to be doing this, um, and it's always going to be relating um, the... Uh, force on some area and saying that's equal to the same uh, force over a different force over a different area. So the pressures are the same um, in a enclosed fluid. Okay, um, gauge pressure, absolute pressure, pressure measurement. Okay, gauge pressure is what you measure uh, in a gauge. So if you're on the surface of the earth walking around um, and you've got a, a tire pressure gauge, it's going to read zero if you're not putting it on a 
uh, car. Uh, of course, it's not zero pressure there. It's one atmosphere or 101,000 pascals. So why is the tire pressure gauge not measuring 100,000 pascals? Well, because it's calibrated to be zero uh, or to say zero at one atmosphere. So the absolute pressure is going to always be one atmosphere plus the gauge um, uh, gauge pressure, okay? And gauge pressure is usually just rho gh if you're in a fluid or something like that. And absolute pressure would be rho gh plus one atmosphere oftentimes, okay? So if you say you got 34 psi in your car, well, 34 psi is the pressure in the tire and uh, um, so on, okay? Absolute pressure is the sum of gauge pressure and atmospheric pressure. So you have to keep track of that because um, that gets a little tricky sometimes. So gauge pressure is positive if the pressure is above atmospheric pressure, and gauge pressure is negative if the pressure is below atmospheric pressure. Um, okay, so the ways to measure um, uh, pressure is with different things, okay? So you can push on, what is this, the aneroid gauge, like a blood pressure cuff. Um, pressure goes in, and it squeezes these little bellows here, and then there's this little machine that, you know, the spring is hooked to the needle, and then it measures uh, the blood pressure there, okay? Um, another thing is called a manometer, and a manometer is um, fluid in a tube, and if it's open to the atmosphere, then the pressure on the ends is one atmosphere. If it's um, closed on one end, for example, I don't know, what is this, Mickey Mouse or something? If it's closed on one end, um, then you're going to have some pressure coming in there, but you're, you're still having one atmosphere over there. So the gauge pressure would be just the relative um, change in height. You see this pressure change? It's going to be the density times gravity times height of this fluid, and that's going to be the gauge pressure, but the absolute pressure will be adding an atmosphere to that because you've got the atmosphere pushing down. Um, same thing over here. You've got the... Um, uh, pressure open to the atmosphere. In this case, let's say you've got something pulled under a vacuum, then it's going to suck the air over this way, and so you'll have negative pressure because it's acting against the um, atmosphere. Um, and there's usually a um, picture of one that's closed. So this one is closed um, to the atmosphere, and that means it has no pressure there. Uh, at that point. This thing is a barometer, um, so you know there are manometers that this is completely closed, and then uh, the pressure is always, the gauge pressure is just all you measure because there's no atmosphere involved. Okay, so um, the uh, a barometer, you've heard the barometer is rising, that means a high pressure system is coming in, it might be a storm coming in, and that is just the atmosphere, it's usually 101,000 pascals, uh, but not always. It can go up a little, it can go down a little, and when the atmospheric pressure increases, it's going to push the water level down because it's equal across this whole thing. In this case, it's mercury, which is a metal that's liquid at room temperatures, but the air pushes on it, and that's going to raise the level in here, and since it's a vacuum, there's nothing to push against or not, so it, it can rise freely. Okay, so if pressure is slightly above normal, then the mercury rises it goes up a certain delta H there. And then you can calculate the change in pressure uh, by uh, measuring the density of mercury times G times H, okay? So um, these are various conversion factors for the different pressure units. Um, we stick to atmospheres and pascals uh, mostly. Sometimes you'll have to do, uh, uh, you know, pounds per square inch or millimeters of mercury, but um, that's not such a big deal. Okay, so um, Archimedes' principle, moving on now. Arch Archimedes' principle is the uh, uh, buoyant force, or uh, how things float, or how to calculate when things will float and when things will not float, okay? So um, the buoyant force is, or the buoyant force, is the net upward force on an object that's in a fluid. Um, let's say you have a fluid that has a... Uh, volume here, and you've got a force pushing down, force pushing up from the bottom, uh, an equal area here, and we're trying to try to estimate the weight of this water and the different forces on there. So at the top, we've got the pressure, 
um, which is rho g h times the uh, area, uh, and then or the force of the top, and the force of the bottom has to balance, which is the you know the water down there, and that's these two things, and then the difference between them. This we can imagine this chunk of water is sitting there in equilibrium, just floating. Um, and or whatever it is, is, if it has the dense, same density of the fluid, if it's just in, in equilibrium there, then we know that these two forces have to equal each other, okay? And that's what we define to be the buoyant force, okay? What's the difference between them, okay? So you have the weight of this thing, and then the buoyant force is pushing up um, to keep them, you know, where they are. And uh, the turns out that... If you get in water, okay, and you're gonna push, if you're a box, you're gonna push that amount of water away, okay? The volume of, let's say you put a box in the water and it sank, but then it floated there right at the surface. The weight of this uh, box is gonna be balanced by something we call the buoyant force. And the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the water displaced, okay? So, um, that's gonna be the density and the volume that's been pushed away of the water, okay? Um, that's the main idea, is that the force available to push up on you that helps you float is equal to weight, is equal to the weight of the water it displaces, okay? And what is the water, the weight of the water it displaces? It's the volume of water, um, density is mass per volume, volume times density is the mass, so volume times density times g is equal to the weight mg of the of the water. Okay, so if we know how much water is displaced, which means we know the volume of it, and we multiply that by the density of water, then that times g is going to be the newtons available of the water to push back on you. Okay, notice if you increase the density, if it's corn syrup or something else, it'll be easier to, or if it's salt water, which has a higher density, then you float more easily because the your buoyant force is higher um, when the density of the fluid is higher, okay? So um, there's some examples here. Um, let's say you put 10,000 metric tons of solid steel submerged in water, um, what would the buoyant force be on it? Um, and then what's the maximum force the water could exert if the same steel were shaped into a boat that could displace uh, that volume of water, okay? So if we just dropped in 10,000 tons of steel into the water, um, we could get that the uh, volume of, uh, do they tell us this? Uh, solid steel, okay, solid steel. Um, so we figure out the density of the, well, let's see, to find the volume mass over density mass of the steel. Oh yeah, okay, so we find the volume of the steel first. We assume it's just a chunk of steel and we get this much volume, there's no air, it's just solid steel. So there's your volume, 10,000 metric tons divided by the density of steel, which we have to look up in the table, and we get that volume. Okay, now, here's the tricky part. The volume of water displaced is, in this case, equal, it's the same as the volume of the steel we submerged. Okay, because the, the steel is going to be completely submerged. It's, uh, none of it's going to be sticking out of the water. It's just going to be uh, completely submerged. So we're going to displace the same volume of water as the volume of steel. So then the mass of the water then, um, because that's what we want to uh, do, is... Uh, go away. I don't know what this is. Okay. Um, the mass of the water that we want to displace is... Uh, we want the weight of the water, which is mg. So we need to calculate the mass of the water. That's the same, uh, it's the density of water times the same volume that we just calculated, and that gives you a million kilograms of water. Okay, so then Archimedes' principle says that this mass of water times g, that's the weight of the water, that's the total number of newtons we have to push back on our sinking steel. Okay, so we're going to have uh, 13 million newtons to push back. Since we know the weight of the steel is mg, we get 9 million newtons, um, it's going to sink, uh, it will stay underwater, but it'll weigh a million times, or 13 million times, 13 million newtons of force less, okay? So then for B, if we shape it into a boat, it's no longer, uh, it's no longer, the buoyant force is no longer just the mass of the steel, um, because the, or the, the, uh, the volume of the steel, 
because now the volume is, we've shaped it into a boat so that it's gonna, we're gonna replace it with air. So that the volume is, um, for part B, if we displace this volume of water and replace it with air, then uh, we have uh, a much greater buoyant force, okay? And uh, so the maximum for that is uh, gonna give you 9.8 times 10 to the eighth newtons, okay? And we know that the weight of the steel uh, just the weight of the steel alone is um, uh, 10, one, uh, sorry, where is it? Yeah, one point, uh, there you go, 9.8, uh, 98 million newtons. Well, this, this buoyant force is way greater than that, so it's 10 times the weight of the steel, meaning the ship can carry nine times its own weight without sinking, okay? So as long as you displace the correct amount of volume. So in this case, we took the steel and um, we, uh, created uh, a ship that can displace this amount of water. And when we push that water and get it out of here, all that water wants to go back to fill that cavity. And that's, if we know the weight of that water that we pushed out, which is mass of the water times uh, gravity, then uh, we can figure it out. Okay, so what's the key here? Mass of the water is equal to the volume uh, that, of the water that was displaced, because we've got uh, density is mass per volume and mass is volume times density. So if we want mg, the weight of the water, we need to do take the mass of the water times the, uh, uh, well, yeah, mg, okay, uh, volume times density times g, okay. So the, um, screwed that up, okay, g. Okay, so we take the density of the water times the volume of water times g, okay? And that's how you can calculate, um, uh, blah, 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 okay. Um, now, if you have a boat that's not underwater, this is where these problems get a little bit uh, tricky. And um, so let's say you have a box, which is, um, let's try this a little better. Um, let's say you have a box that is um, only partially submerged. So it's got a total length H, and then only this little bit L is actually underwater, okay? And you know that the overall weight of this box, um, weight of the box is there, and we have the case that the weight of the box um, is balanced by this buoyant force in this, in this situation. So you've got the weight of the box pushing down, and then you've got the weight of the water pushing back, weight down, uh, buoyant force up, and those two forces are canceling each other out because it's just sitting there. Okay, what's the weight of the box? Well, it's probably given to us. It's m mass of the box times gravity. What's the buoyant force? Okay, the buoyant force is the weight of the water. Okay, what is the weight of the water? It's, um, we need to know, let's say it's a box, so this is L and that's L, or let's say that those two dimensions are the same. So the weight of the water is the density of water times uh, the, if we go back up to where we were, okay, we want the weight of the water, which is the density of the water, times the volume of the water, times gravity. So we're gonna take the density of water times the uh, gravity times the volume of the water. Okay, so density of water times gravity. What's the volume of the water here? It's length times length times, uh, uh, yeah, um, we're gonna, we've got length times length, and then we're, I didn't say this, but let's assume the box is uh, the same length in that dimension too. Okay, length times length times length. Okay, so then um, we can calculate that the mass of the uh, box times gravity equals this density of water times gravity times the volume of the water. Length times length times length. Okay, and then that is going to give us the equation for um, the... Uh, in this case, the problem might be solving for uh, how much, how high out of the water is the box sticking. And so then if you know um, that the total length is H, and then from here you say that the mass of the box, and you see that gravity cancels out, divided by the density of water, um, and then uh, 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 is equal to L cubed, and then you take the cube root of that, and then you take H minus L. Once you figure out what L is, you can get that um, there. Okay, so um, that's just the type of, or then you get the 
extra little bit that's sticking out of the water, okay? And so that's the typical problem you're gonna have to do here. Um, uh, let's see, blah, blah, blah. And um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, calculating average density. So you got someone floating in the water, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's those are weird problems. They make me uncomfortable. Um, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, so this is the this is the Archimedes sort of story. Um, let's say you've got this coin um, and you want to determine if it's made out of the right material. So you got this uh, coin that you can measure um, to have this density, about eight grams. When you put it in the water, as in 11.24, 11.24. Yep. Okay. So you've got so you've measured the you measured the mass of the thing, and now you put the coin underwater. Okay. And um, you got that its apparent mass is 7.8 grams, okay? So what is apparent mass? You put it underwater, so there's a buoyant force that pushes up, and the buoyant force uh, reduces its weight um, by a little bit, and you see that its apparent mass is 7.8 grams. That means you displaced um, 8.63 grams minus 7.8 grams. It means you displaced um, that amount of water okay, uh, because that's what the buoyant force is, is the uh, weight of the water displaced, okay? So the mass of the water then is the, the change of those two masses, and you can get the mass of the water is uh, 0.830 grams, okay? Notice that Latin G versus this kind of New York Times font G, uh, you know, Times New Roman uh, font G, this is grams down here, and that's 9.8 meters per second. Sorry, this, wait a second. No, I guess these are all grams. That's a little confusing, isn't it? Um, it's apparent mass of 7.8 grams, but this G is, okay. I wanted to, sometimes you have G in there, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, but we don't have that in any part of this problem, so I guess we don't have to worry about that. Okay, so um, you can get the mass of the water there, and then the volume of the water is that, and that's also the volume of the coin, since it's completely submerged. Right, so now we can find the density um, because we can take the mass of the coin divided by the volume of the coin, and then we get this density, 10.4 grams per centimeter cubed. So that density is very close to pure silver, which that coin should be. So that's pretty cool. So that's how you can determine what something is made out of, um, and that's the Archimedes principle. He's trying to figure out the mass of a gold crown um, to figure out if it was actually solid gold or not, and that's the, the story here. Okay. Um, and, da, da, da. and okay, uh, cohesion and adhesion in liquids, um, surface tension and capillary action. So surface tension um, is, uh, you know, you've ever filled a glass of water and you can kind of see this little thing over the top that doesn't quite uh, spill over yet. Um, that's surface tension. The liquid is holding on to each other and doesn't want to break through until... Uh, you really break that thing. We're not going to spend a lot of time on surface tension, so we're not going to calculate a lot of things with surface tension. Um, so you can kind of actually skip this uh, problem, uh, or these sections. I recommend just reading it, but um, not spending a whole lot of time on it. Okay, and then capillary action is, let's see, are we in capillary? Yeah, capillary action is the tendency of the fluid to be raised or suppressed in a narrow tube or a cap capillary tube. Okay, so, um, you know, like water going up a rag or something like that, um, and they, the water can just kind of squeeze itself up into a tube, okay? And so, we, we're, again, we're not going to calculate any of that. It's a little bit more complicated than we need to worry about. Uh, pressures in the body, so these are just some pressures, gauge pressure measurements um, in blood pressure or uh, in different parts of the um, body, things like that, okay? So blood pressure, you've got your, so this is just more uh, m medical types of things. So these are good to just read about if you're interested in them, uh, if you're planning to go into this field or, you know, veterinary or human science or something like that. And then you got uh, pressure in the eye, uh, intraocular pressure. Um, this buildup leads to glaucoma, and uh, glaucoma is when you have abnormally large pressure, it can damage your optic nerve. So um, there's a device that pushes on your eyeball to measure the pressure in it. Um, you guys probably had that maybe uh, by now. Okay, you've got pressure in the eardrum, uh, some other examples here, 
pressures in the body. So those are just for your information if you're interested in reading them. Okay, so in summary, what is a fluid? You have liquids and gases. They're both fluids. Liquids uh, take the shape of their container. So do gases. The difference is that gases fill the entire container, whereas liquids just uh, fill you know up until they're used up. Okay, density is mass per volume. Uh, the mass of an object divided by the volume of it. So if you've got a bowling ball, okay, and it's got a mass of 10 kilograms or something like that, um, and it has a volume of 4 thirds pi r cubed, then the mass divided by that volume will tell you the density. It's the little piece, the mass per volume. So if you make 10 bowling balls, you just multiply the density by 10 times the volume, okay, uh, to get the mass. It's kilograms per meter cubed. Uh, pressure is force per area. Um, and it's newtons per meter skew, uh, squared, and that's uh, the unit is called the Pascal. Uh, pressure varies with depth. The deeper you go in a fluid, the higher the pressure. And the general form of that is rho gh. And they always put the h first in this book, and I don't like that. Rho gh. G is 9.8 meters per second squared. Rho is the density of the liquid, uh, and h is how deep you are in the fluid. Pascal's principle says that you apply a pressure here, you get a pressure there. So if you have a force per area here, you get the same force per area over here, but you might have a, a bigger area and a bigger force versus a smaller area and a smaller force, um, and that's how a hydraulic system works. Gauge pressure is just the measurement of what you could imagine a gauge reading, uh, tire pressure gauge, uh, blood pressure gauge. You're ignoring the pressure of the atmosphere uh, at the bottom of this uh, oxygen ocean, okay? Um, so the absolute pressure is always the gauge pressure plus one atmosphere uh, if you're at uh, the surface of the Earth, or relative to the surface of the Earth, okay? Um, and then uh, Archimedes' principle says that the uh, uh, force available to push back on you when you jump into a lake is equal to the volume of the water you displace. So the more uh, water you displace, the um, bigger the forces that's pushing back on you. Okay, so that's why you want to take a deep breath um, and that inflates your lungs, displaces more water, pushes, uh, makes a larger cavity in the water and helps you float a little more. Okay, and then we didn't talk too much or we won't go into the cohesion um, too much, but you should read that and pressures in the body, kind of nice just to know good information there. Um, but otherwise, don't worry about those things. Okay, that's it. Bye.